Okay, good afternoon everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce you to you, uh, Corporate Reeve and Meyer, growing up from the uh, University of Prince Edward Island in Canada. Corporate's actually here in Scotland on sabbatical for, for a spell, and Meyer is, uh, has dropped by on her way to a much more important meeting in Florence after <laughs> she's been here to Scotland. Uh, Chris and I worked together for many years on a variety of, uh, of topics and problems. Corp has an interesting background. He came to academia rather late in life, saw the light um, later than most of us. He used to work for IBM in, uh, in the computing industry uh, and has developed interests through his collaboration with George Bettenby at Strathclyde in epidemiology and modeling uh, epidemiological problems. And much, I suppose, of his recent effort has been place in aquaculture and the interactions uh, between aquaculture sites and also between uh, aquaculture sites and, and wild fisheries. Uh, and the focus of the talk is going to be on these, applying these kind of models. Maya has a similarly complex uh, background ranging from uh, looking at disease in amphibians, uh, also sea lice on, uh, on farmed salmon, and has a current interest in seagrass communities and using drone technology to, uh, to map seagrasses. So a variety of approaches, but hopefully we're going to learn, I'm certainly going to learn something about the application of these much more complex model systems to understanding what's going on in the real world. Hopefully. So, okay, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. As Chris mentioned, I've been working uh, for a while with uh, him and colleagues, Sanio Hazen and, and others, so um, nice to be able to present to you. Uh, we're going to try and focus today on uh, two things, I suppose, uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview. First of all, the context of the talk in terms of exploring the use of models, uh, data and models, is going to be in the particular um, ecological setting of sea lice, both in farmed and wild settings. So I'll probably say a little tiny bit about sea lice to start with, just in case. I, I shouldn't make the assumption that everyone's a sea lice expert. I know that you're probably familiar with various uh, um, pathogens in, in marine environments, but we'll start with that. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the importance of good quality data and the use of that data then within different modeling frameworks. I'll kind of kick off with some reasonably straightforward statistical modeling approaches that we've adopted, uh, just to make you familiar with that. Hopefully a lot of that will be pretty uh, standard for, for those of you who are working in quantitative uh, modeling. I'm going to pass over to Maya to really fill you in on some of the more interesting, in inverted commas, uh, simulation and, and mathematical modeling approaches that we've been adopting over the last two to three years. Um, and mm -hmm. then she may pass back to just look at the lessons that we've learned here and what applications they might have for other domains that may be of more interest to you. And we'll try and keep it to 45 minutes if we can so that there's time for a little bit of question and interaction at the end because I think it's always more productive when we get questions in terms of what you're really interested in rather than just us telling you what we're interested in or working on. So um, just in case you don't know that much about sea lice, uh, very, very sort of uh, 101 as they say in North America where I'm now based, uh, the 101 of sea lice uh, and sea lice epidemiology. They're a naturally occurring ectoparasite of a number of um, marine fish species. We are going to be particularly interested in a couple of uh, the sea lice species that parasitize salmonids. Um, and the first thing to just sort of pop up here is a little note about the life history of this parasite. I really put this up because Maya said to me when we were chatting last night, you have told them what uh, the sea lice history, uh, sea lice uh, life cycle looks like. And I said, no, I hadn't, but I better do that uh, because it's relevant to some of the modeling work later. So essentially these uh, copepodids uh, start their life as a, leaf, uh, a free living stage in the water column, sort of from the hatched eggs through to the uh, napuline copepodid stages. They then attach to the fish. Uh, grow in one attached spot, hence the name attached stages, through various calamari stages. Then they become pre-adults, sexually mature, uh, and adults. But what's interesting about this slide is that this actually comes from three or four years ago. And uh, I was thinking about the issue of models uh, earlier. Of course, when we do a mathematical model of uh, this kind of growth, we essentially simplify the world down and we just maybe throw things into one, two, three, four compartments, we don't really care about the males because they don't uh, play much role in the reproductive uh, role, so we sort of grab the females of interest and the eggs are being laid and so forth. 
So we already simplify the world down, and, and we maybe get a little bit of uh, criticism for being too sim simplistic or simplifying the world. But one of the interesting things is that literally, I think it was two years ago or yeah, a year and a half ago, a paper came out that actually pointed out that our knowledge of sea lice was somewhat limited. And in fact, they did not have four calamus stages in terms of distinctive molts. There was really probably only two calamus stages rather than four. So actually, our simplification of throwing everything into one bucket probably wasn't so, such a bad. We were actually sort of just half as right as everyone who had done this. But the point was that even in a biological model where we're looking at what we might view as a sort of a physical representation of what happens, there's still a level of, uh, of modeling and, and uh, moving away from the reality. And of course, in mathematics, we're often just moving that back one or two or three layers further in terms of the, the sort of conceptual view of, of the world that we're adopting. Um, oh, sorry, in terms of why they're important uh, to study as a, as a parasite, two real focuses that we'll look at. One is their importance from the farmed community point of view. So very much a, a key disease pathogen problem for fish farms, but also potentially because of the issue of uh, large amounts of biomass aggregating in certain places, this idea of uh, sort of biomagnification. So the spillover effect into wild populations has been of much interest in Ireland, Scotland, and particularly on the west coast of Canada, as we'll see in a moment. So are these important to salmon farms? Yeah, you bet they are. So rather than give you some sort of peer review type process, I just went and looked on a couple of the websites. And for example, in the last quarter, of 2014, so the last probably financial quarter we have data for, sea lice were responsible for about, well, I'm thinking pounds, that's about 15 million GB pounds of loss to one company working within the sector. So aggregate that up across all the companies in the sector. You're talking hundreds of millions of pounds of costs, both in terms of direct costs, but also in terms of treatment and management costs associated with managing this parasite. I think if you speak to most people who work in the fish farming industry, they would say, and salmon farming, they'd say that sea lice still represent the major uh, health or pathogen-related problem. And not just in Norway, not just in Scotland, but also Canada and Chile and elsewhere. So this particular company happens to work across the globe, and in all of their markets in that particular time frame, they are having problems. Just to make a note as we pass uh, by this, that although uh, sea lice are an issue in different jurisdictions, they, it's maybe worth knowing that there are different uh, species of sea lice. So we'll be primarily focused on uh, the Lepiothera salmonis, which is a salmonid specific, a host uh, specific parasite. It only uh, parasitizes salmonids. The Caligus species tend to have a range of host parasites, uh, sorry, a range of hosts that they will parasitize. And in, for example, the west coast of Canada, which we'll also look at, uh, we have a different Caligus species, Clemency. Down in Chile, they have a very different uh, parasite, again, the Roger Cressi uh, Caligus species. So the point there, I think, is also that uh, assuming that one model will fit all is not necessarily a wise thing to do. Uh, if you look at the reproductive history, for example, of Roger Cressi, even the, the size intensity patterns that you see with some of these parasites, they're very distinctive from what we see with some of the northern-based parasites. So assuming you just throw all these parasites because they're called sea lice and they happen to be parasitizing some monads into one modeling box is not necessarily a safe assumption, although sometimes it's not a bad first approximation. All right. On to the, away from the salmon farms to the wild, and I like this because this is going back four years um, to the Vancouver Olympics, which were in 2010. But I love this little headline, uh, where apparently Norway actually lost quite sig uh, significantly to uh, the Canadians. And uh, of course, there's a lot of ill feeling in certain parts of the community within the west coast of Canada to the Norwegian multinationals who've come in as sort of deemed to be this sort of large multinational coming in and raiding their environment, using up their uh, pristine water conditions and so on. So apparently some shaman had cursed that cast a spell on the Norwegian team, and that was the, the source. I'm not sure if anybody modeled that and whether it would stand up to uh, any uh, analysis, but there you go. So British Columbia in particular has been the focus of concerns around uh, impacts on wild salmon, but so has Scotland and, and the west coast of Ireland, as we'll see later. And this is really the first time I wanted to talk a little bit about um, data, and then we'll get to the models. And this is probably one of the most famous pictures of sea lice that you'll find. If you go to Wikipedia and have a look for sea lice, you'll almost certainly find this somewhere around there. 
And uh, very stark headline, you know, lice from fish farms are killing wild salmon. No ifs, no buts, no context, no, uh, no nothing. Um, so that's interesting. There's a, there's a picture. Um, we did some work in this particular area of British Columbia from which that uh, small smoke came. Uh, according to the person who took the photograph. And that's in the Broughton Archipelago area, just here in the north part of uh, Vancouver Island on, on the mainland, in fact. So this is a pretty big project. It actually involved both the salmon producers, the government, and some environmental NGOs. In fact, the, the very environmental uh, NGO who, from which that photograph comes was, was one of the um, sort of participants in a slightly circuitous route, but we don't want to get into the details of that. Uh, the point really is that this is a pretty big data set going over a decade's worth of data involving uh, almost a quarter of a million, um, well, 200,000 samples. We also had all of the data from the fish farms in that area. So a very large and rich data set. I don't have time to get into that today, but I thought it might be interesting to look at Sorry, and we, this is just to note that we published all of this result, all of these results online, so it was very much a transparent process, trying to get beyond the environmental polarization of debate and actually get to the data, which would then let us get onto modeling and science. But I wanted to come back to this picture here. And what you'll notice here is that these are uh, three adult female, you can tell here obviously the, the, the gravid egg strings are very obvious, but these are also people. So this is three adult females on one very small, Smoke. That's probably not very good news for that smoke. The question I'm interested in is, from a data and a modeling point of view, is this really the status out there, or is this just some sort of anecdotal observation that might have been made? Well, we looked at the data that we had, and out of those 177,000 fish that were sampled in that decade, 125 of them had this kind of characteristic, in other words, three or more adult females. However, we also know that from looking at the data, 2004, something very strange happened. We don't have a total understanding of why it happened, but it was a very distinctively different and outlying uh, year. So if we remove the 2004 data from the equation, there's actually only six fish that fall into that category. And further, the actual claim on that original picture was that these lice come from fish farms and therefore probably by definition should be Lepiothera salmonis rather than the Calgary species. So if we sort of make the, the uh, search term be Lep salmonis and an adult female and not the year 2004, we're back down to two fish. Now I'm not saying those two fish don't exist and I'm not saying that that wasn't a real photograph. I'm just saying that is something that characterizes 0.0013% of the smokes necessarily a good way to you know, base your, your science and your judgment on? I, I suspect not. What I'm not saying is that sea lice is not an issue for these wild salmon. I'm just saying that to characterize this photograph as being representative of the data or the model that would be useful in this particular context is probably at worst disingenuous and certainly not very helpful. So, can you lie with data? Well, of course you can. Uh, I always liked this book, and of course I wanted to change the lies to lice, but I never really had the guts to have a talk called lice, mm -hmm. lice and statistics. But anyway, uh, you know, you, can, you, can the data lie? Well, I'm not sure if the data can lie, but certainly you can lie with the data. And I love this little quote from Steven Stigler, um, the more you torture the data, the more likely they are to confess. Uh, but confessions obtained under duress may not be admissible in the court of scientific opinion. I thought that's a, that's a really nice uh, way to put things. Some people sort of, when they're faced with some of these challenges, sort of almost give up and say, well, all this modeling stuff and data and so on, it's not going to answer any of our questions. It's, it's all a little bit of a, you know, it depends whose data you're looking at. Well, I don't believe that. I think it's just uh, a motivation to press for better models, better data, better interpretation of those models. I mean, that's what the scientific method has been based on for the last 200 years in, in, in Western philosophy. So I think you know, we, we can't just give up, hold up our hands and say you know, we can't work with the data. But we do have to think more critically about data models. So moving beyond the data um, to statistics, sorry, just, just a few little cartoons. You maybe have to think about that one for a moment. But I like this sort of causality versus correlation story. Um, and uh, just to show my age, when I was a, a student, or certainly a young professional, Dilbert was uh, very popular. Um, so I like this one here, moving from the 
the statistics of the model. So, yeah, excellent. I can use a nonlinear math model with data mining technology to optimize our retail chain. <laughs> if that's the same thing as spam, we're having a good meeting here. Yeah. So there's that kind of, you know, that slightly uh, cynical view of what are we doing with these models. And, and actually, just one more, Dilbert, while we're, we're here, because I just want to have one very quick aside into the issue of the importance of good data, because it's something that I kind of feel very strongly about and really one of the reasons I'm working with Chris. Yeah, 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 I like that. So, you know, this issue, you know, garbage in, garbage out, uh, and, uh, you know, and what do we do with the, the data is very nice. Um, quality data cannot be overestimated. If you don't have that, then you really have nothing, irrespective of how sophisticated and clever um, your models are. And I had the good fortune of when I first came into the sea lice area in the early 2000s, uh, there was a guy who'd been working sort of almost in this Victorian <laughs> uh, model of, of science, you know, very much pre-computers and so on. But if you look at the, de in fact, you can't see the colors here, but essentially this was uh, some sampling that he had done on a fish farm back in uh, 1978, so the very early days of fish farming in Scotland. And for each of these fish, he'd actually been looking at the stages and also the, the colors are actually representative of the two main species, the Caligus and the Lepiotherus. You can see it down here. So significant infestation, actually, as, as you can see, pretty horrendous by modern uh, standards. But just having this kind of quality of data, in fact, I, I got some money to pay someone for four months to enter this into a more modern digital format because it was so rich, even though there was only about, I think, a year and a half's worth uh, of data. And when I was doing my own PhD, I used to often go down to the British Library uh, to do a little bit of writing. And there's this wonderful um, statue there in, in the square in the British Library by a um, Scottish uh, sculptor, as you may know. But it's about Sir Isaac Newton. And uh, I'm always reminded of uh, his quote about standing on the shoulders of giants. And as I say, this, this particular pioneer, Gordon Ray, sadly died just not long after I started my own PhD of cancer. But um, just realizing the importance of people spending the time and, and that careful attention to detail. And I guess one of the reasons I've enjoyed working with Chris so much, because he has that same characteristic. He just likes to get his attention to detail right, and then he does all the hard work, and I just come along and do the little bits of modeling, so that's the easy part. Anyway, so much for the data. I want to say something very briefly about models, and I'm going to pass on to Maya to talk a bit about the um, simulation and mathematical models. So in terms of statistical models, um, before, I, well, before I get to just a few examples of how we've used these statistical models, um, maybe just want to remind us that often visualization, I think particularly, I, I do a lot of work also in data mining and what's now called data science or big data, and visualization tools are improving all the time. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that the larger the data set, the more important it always becomes to get some sort of feel for the data. Before you start modeling it, just have a sense of what it is you're looking at. And I'm a great believer that, uh, yes, a model can tease out details, it can pick apart interactions, it can do all kinds of interesting things, but if it tells you something very different from your immediate intuitive uh, visual uh, appreciation of the data, then either there's something wrong with your visualization or there's something very complex happening in, in, in your data set that you're not able to see. So although I've published, I've got, I don't know, probably upwards of 30 or 40 uh, papers in the whole area of sea lice, 20 or so relating to Scotland, almost all of which have mathematical and statistical models uh, in them. In some ways, I'm almost sort of prouder of some of these very simple descriptive summaries. So this is going back a little bit uh, in time. But just from this very simple graphic, I mean, there's a couple of things that you could just tell me off the top of your head. I haven't put error bars on here. These are about 100,000 samples, so the error bars can be very, very small. This is all, well, it's, it's all the fish farms from one of the biggest companies in Scotland at the time, so there's about uh, 100 sites represented in this, in this graph. But you could already tell me, just looking at this, at least two things. I'm going to have a bit of audience participation. Tell me at least one thing you can tell me from this graph. If you can't tell me anything, I'm going to be like really disappointed. Nora, what can you tell me about this? Yeah, okay, so there's something happened over time that, yeah, yeah. Well, basically, we had much better chemicals to control the sea lice in this period is the answer to that. Well, that's, that's one observation that's very true. Anything else that you Indeed, indeed, yeah. So we'd have to clarify exactly what we mean here, but essentially this means the first and second year of production. So salmon tend to go to sea for sort of 18 to 22 months. So in the second year of their, uh, when they're in the sea, in a farm condition, they're much more, much higher, yeah, significantly higher. 
Now, this is the species at Salmonis, uh, Lepithera Salmonis. What about if you look at Caligus elongatus? Well, sorry, the, the scale there has changed. We've half the scale, so just be aware of that. Overall, they're lower. Maybe this decline thing is noticeable, maybe not quite so. But in terms of your first year, second year, what's pretty apparent here, that's not. In fact, it's not even not the case that it's higher in the second year. You could probably make the case it's actually lower in the second year. Why is that? Is there some competition happening between the species? Um, we're not going to get into that just now. But just something very simple in terms of visualizing that leads to lots of questions and gives you a very simple appreciation of what's going on. If we then look at not all of the years, but look at these years separated into their essential first year and second year at sea, the other interesting thing we see is, well, obviously we see the, the Salmonis get much bigger in the second year than the first year. But in terms of temporal patterns, look at this. This just is a sort of slowly growing pattern, exponential growth, in fact, with lots of treatment interventions trying to control things. But what's happening with the Caligus? They've got this very nice seasonal pattern, essentially just around the middle of the summer there, they're kind of peaking and then falling. And then for some reason, is it competition with these guys up here? I don't know, interesting question. But we see that same pattern repeated, but a much lower level. So before we ever get into the models, before we ever get into understanding some of those details, just visualizing uh, some of that information is very important. So I'm going to say something very briefly about a few models. I don't want to break into my time um, too much. This will be very quick. Um, as I say, you're probably familiar with all of these uh, generally or regression, logistic regression type models, uh, some of the, the spatial and temporal time series, and then some meta-analysis. So just give an illustration of how we've used each of these, and I'll maybe skip through this more quickly than I planned because I don't want to run into my time. So first of all, sort of simple um, linear models. One of my, well, one of our most highly cited papers still is this paper by Fiona Lees and ourselves. She was one of the postdocs in our group, which is really the first time that uh, emamectin benzoate resistance or tolerance to that particular chemical therapeutic had been reported. Uh, we wrote this paper in 2008. It wasn't until I think 2012 that we had kind of confirmation from laboratory-based tests that there was some sort of indicator of what the genetic mechanism might be. So four or five years ahead of the very detailed, hard, rigorous work of looking at the actual causal mechanism, if you like, from a genetics point of view. But we could, you know, already just by looking at large data sets and applying appropriate mathematical modeling techniques, find out, you know, what the key drivers were. So as well as noticing that there was this key uh, temporal shift, particularly as we moved into 2006 and beyond, we also noticed that winter um, treatments tend to be much more susceptible to being failed. So this is essentially a logistic model uh, where the outcome is successful or non-successful treatment. Again, just going back to our story on the visual, if you look at what was actually happening over the years, you could probably have predicted what the logistic model told you. You wouldn't have seen the winter breakdown, but essentially, you know, when, when the chemical was working very well, you got almost 100% reduction in your mobile numbers. As the years progress, you see poorer and poorer clearance until you get to this sort of almost, almost total breakdown in 2006, where in certain treatments, you're effectively not having any impact on the lice population whatsoever. We did a similar thing when we came to uh, do some work in Canada. They had exactly the same problems of resistance in Canada as they've had in Scotland and in Norway. Sorry, I should say the east coast of Canada. There's no evidence of this yet in the west coast of Canada. And Maya might explain to us why that might be the case in one of her uh, models that she's going to illustrate to us. Um, again, the visual story summarizes quite a lot of, you know, there's lots of details in this uh, mixed linear logistic, uh, sorry, regression model. But actually, some of the key interactions here, looking at how things progress from the year of the first suspected problem with tolerance or resistance through to kind of five years later, you see a very similar trajectory in terms of the, the growth of the resistance profile in Canada, or well, the East Coast Canada, New Brunswick, and the Scottish case. So we can use these kind of linear models. We can also add sort of temporal or spatial dimensions to make them a little bit more uh, interesting or robust, particularly if we're interested in things like farm-to-farm -farm transmission. So here's another paper that kind of looks at that. In this case, we're turning our focus towards Chile. And in particular, we're interested in looking at the relative importance of self-reinfection on farms and infection from neighboring farms in the Chilean context with this other uh, parasite species I mentioned before, uh, Caligus roger crescent. 
Um, again, we're not going to have time to look at all the, the model. This model is actually even more complex because it's a two-part um, nested model. Uh, essentially, you've got a part one of the model, which is a logist logic model, which looks at predicting the likelihood of any infection. And then once you've got some sort of infection, you have a continuous model to look at the non-zero cases, if you like, in terms of looking at continuous model. And, and the sort of, some of the interesting things that came out of that was that essentially using uh, various model fitting criteria, um, the 30 kilometer distance in terms of zone of infectivity gave us the best fit in, in terms of farm to farm interaction. So up to 30 kilometers in the Chilean case um, seems like a, a good fit in terms of looking at what the, the inter-farm um, infectivity uh, transmission might be. So I'm going to pass on to mine in a moment. This final uh, slide here is on using meta-analysis. So I guess most of you are familiar with meta-analysis where you essentially take multiple reported uh, trials, for example, and then you try and aggregate the common lessons across those different trials. And we did this for uh, a reasonably recent paper, 2012, I think we published this paper, um, Chris. And, and the reason really that we got interested in this was that this paper came out of um, an Irish group and lots of the press uh, jumped on it. And this is, for example, our own Glasgow Herald uh, here in Scotland, which essentially came away with this headline that, you know, sea lice no longer need to be worried about. They're just, they're just not, a, not a problem, apparently, mm -hmm. according to the study. Um, and we were a bit concerned because we didn't actually think that was a very valid interpretation of what the study results or how the study results could really be interpreted. Mm -hmm. So analysis, um, I think Chris was involved in, in that and really was the driving force behind that. And Marta Kukosek, who's also quite well known in the, in the area of sea lice modeling, was one of the, the authors on that. Um, we don't have a lot of time to talk about this particular paper, but in terms of the meta-analysis, here's the kind of classic um, forest and tree plot of the random effects uh, meta-analysis. And what you see, of course, is there is quite a lot of variability. Sorry, I should explain that the, the basic uh, premise of these trials is you feed a proportion of your smolts uh, protective uh, therapeutic, and you let the rest act as controls, and then you release them, and then you look at capture rates afterwards. So it's the closest thing is we'll come to an experimental trial in terms of this wild setting with all the usual ecological noise that will be associated with that. Um, and what you found is that, yes, you will have variability in terms of the number of returns, but essentially there's a consistent uh, odds ratio in favor of the treated fish. So the, f the fish that are treated with the anti sea lice uh, therapeutic will have about a 1.4 um, odds ratio in terms of their, their mean chance of success of coming back as compared to the control fish. And as I say, in fact, there's only, I think it was only, there's only one or two trials where uh, the actual mean was on the other side of the line. You can see the conferences will sometimes span the line of no effect. But in general, the trials show that it's an effect. To be fair to the people who wrote the original article, um, it wasn't quite so much, although we feel their methodology wasn't as robust as it could have been, it was probably less an issue of methodology in our, the difference of our methodology from their methodology, and it was probably more an issue of interpretation. So Chris sent me this little note uh, from the London Times last couple of weeks ago, which was uh, essentially about people criticizing uh, the way in which statin trials have been reported in the medical press so that rather than just saying that you've got like the likelihood of reducing from a 2% you know, uh, risk in the population down to 1%, you talk about that as a 50% benefit, you know, which is true in terms of relative risk. So we actually were on the opposite side of that argument because uh, what was being reported in uh, the Irish paper was they said things like, well, there's only a 2% improvement in the return rate on uh, salmon when you treat them with this chemotherapy. Um, but that's a 2% improvement on a 2% base rate. So it's a doubling. So you've got, 20, you know, or it was, I think it was about a 5% return as opposed to a 3% base rate. So just saying it's a 2% improvement doesn't really capture the fact that 95% of your fish are going to die anyway just due to natural mortality. So in our case, we felt that the issue of relative risk was more important. In this case, they're arguing that in a population of humans, the sort of absolute risk is maybe more interesting in terms of if there are other side effects and so forth and statins. Anyway, what I've done there is hopefully taking you through a few different kind of more traditional statistical models and how they've been applied to this uh, particular uh, problem. Maya, I have written, run four minutes into your time. I apologize for that. But you want to take us through some of the simulation and mathematical models. Thanks very much. 
<coughs> I'll try and see if we can switch this technology without making too much noise. Can you guys hear me? Oh, and I need, yeah. Uh, yes, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the simulations and mathematical models that we can use to understand uh, sea louse infestations. Uh, and when we think about, yeah, I don't know. There we go. Uh, so when we think about any disease, it's really an interaction between a host, a parasite, and the environment that they're existing in. And factors of all of these uh, can contribute to the occurrence of disease. And in some cases, we can collect data and use statistical models and observations to understand these interactions. Uh, but there are often limitations, um, especially with disease. We have ethical limitations about doing infections. Uh, in some cases, we can't, we don't have the time span to do an evolutionary trial if we're looking at the development of immune function or resistance. Um, and other cases, maybe we just don't have funding or resources. Uh, so in these cases, simulations and mathematical models are incredible tools for exploring some hypothetical scenarios, intractable systems, long-term projections, um, or for testing uh, different general theories. So these are some of the questions we've addressed in the sea life system using mathematical models, uh, first looking at how current and projected environmental variation uh, influences sea loss populations. So in a climate change context, you might be interested in a few different scenarios. Uh, that's obviously not something you could test uh, experimentally. Um, we can look at different uh, applied questions in regards to management of salmon farms um, and different uh, treatment regimens and uh, methods to make them more sustainable. And then finally, we can look at uh, evolutionary questions like the evolution of resistance to chemical treatments in sea lice uh, and use simulations to look at how different environmental conditions influence that process. Uh, there's a number of different modeling approaches we can use uh, in simulations, uh, and it really depends on what kinds of questions you're interested in. So in the case of sea lice, some of the factors we might want to incorporate are uh, host or parasite growth and survival, so basic life history. We may want some dynamic processes that are dependent on current conditions, so you could have density dependence, population growth, or competition, or predation. Uh, we also have instantaneous events. Uh, these could be uh, chemical treatments that very rapidly change populations. Uh, and then we have uh, individual processes, random processes, and then we may want to be able to solve for equilibrium. So that's really trying to understand thresholds and breakpoints in our system uh, and kind of come up with more uh, general theory about how the system is working. These are some of the um, different types of models we can use. Uh, you guys might be familiar with differential equation models, like the FIR model or predator-prey lack of Volterra models. Um, differential, delay differential equations are quite similar. They just use time as um, another variable in the model. Um, and then we have the two that I'm going to talk about, which are population matrix models and individual-based models. And, the population matrix models really come out of uh, ecological theory, whereas the individual-based models are really uh, coming out of computer science. So when we look at some of the pros and cons of the different models, um, they really vary in what they're able to do. Uh, so there's not kind of a best model for all situations. It really depends on what you're interested in asking uh, uh, in, your, in your question. Uh, so the two we'll be talking about are population matrix models and individual-based models. So the first question to address is about how current and projected environmental variation influences sea louse populations. Uh, and if we look uh, at a relatively small area, such as the Broughton Archipelago in British Columbia, um, these are red areas are 
sites of farms where we actually have temperature and salinity data over um, quite a bit of time. And we can see that there's both uh, spatial and temporal variation in salinity and temperature. So this is across uh, a little over a year. And you can see that if we go to our most estuarine farm, we get um, quite a lot of variation in both temperature and salinity. Salinity is in blue, temperature is in red. Uh, and they're, they're correlated as well. So when temperature goes down, salinity goes up, which makes sense if we're having uh, river runoff in the spring. Um, moving away from the estuary, you get a little bit less variation. And then this might just be a few miles away that we have almost flat lines for salinity and temperature. And so we have wild salmon going through all of these conditions. And we have farm salmon that may be stuck in uh, farm that's in any one of these places. So how does this influence sea louse population dynamics? Uh, we went through the literature and uh, what we found is that there have been a lot of lab studies looking at effects of salinity and temperature on survival and development of sea lice. And salinity uh, alters sea louse survival. So um, you can see that after, oops, here we've got um, almost complete mortality at about 15 parts per million, or sorry, parts per thousand. Um, in contrast, uh, this is from a literature review by Stian et al. Um, temperature just alters development. So the warmer it is, uh, the faster these sea lice grow and develop. So these both can uh, alter uh, population trajectories of sea lice. And we can use a population matrix model to really understand this. So the way this model works is that we have, uh, this is why we needed the uh, life history um, table that Crawford showed you. So we have our different life stages. And in every stage, there's a probability transitioning and a probability of staying in that stage. And then for these adult stages, so these are, yeah, these adult stages, we have fecundity, um, so probabilities of producing eggs. We can take all of these values and put them in a matrix format. Uh, so these are these same values. Um, so the probability of staying in a stage versus transitioning and multiply it by population um, numbers for each of these life stages. And so we can use this uh, to do different simulations. And so each of these stages, each of these values here is a function of both the current salinity and temperature. Um, so it's, it's a bit more complex than it looks here. But we can use this first to run simulations. So here we've got time on the x-axis and the number of individuals. Notice the scales are fairly different here. And we ran simulations for those three different scenarios I showed earlier. So you can see in the estuarine condition, we get fairly rapid extinction of our population. In this case, uh, this is due to the low salinity, which will kill our sea lice. And then in the mid and oceanic conditions, we get exponential growth. It's especially high in this mid scenario because we, don't, we, have, we have slightly warmer temperatures than we do in the oceans. Um, and then this could probably vary over uh, across different years. Um, we can also solve for different equilibriums using the population matrix models. Uh, so one value we might be interested in is the lambda or the population growth rate. So Values above this dotted line, above one, you have population growth. And values below, you're going to have decline. So across different salinities and with different temperatures here, you can see that warmer temperatures in red, you have faster population growth. And it's also faster with higher salinities. So all these values here, that's where you're going to get extinction. If you want to understand why, we can look at a few different values. Um, so again, population growth rate. And now we're looking at generation time of the sea lice uh, and R0, which is the basic reproductive ratio. So that's the number of individuals a sea louse will have that survive to be adults in the next generation. So again, we can see for generation time, there's not much of an effect of salinity, right? It's fairly flat lines across here, maybe a little variation. Um, but this basic reproductive ratio is very influenced by salinity as well as temperature. So strong temperature influence on generation time. 
and both salinity and temperature influence reproduction. So now we can say why and how these environmental variables are going to influence these populations. So the next uh, question we addressed with simulations is looking at how we can manage farms sustainably to reduce sea lice infections. Uh, so the salmon farms are managed in a number of different ways. Uh, some of these are at the regional level, such as um, fallowing across a number of farms, coordinating the placement of salmon into farms, um, and just having coordinated monitoring and reporting of your data. But within the farms, there's two main approaches. The first is the use of chemical treatments to kill the lice. Uh, and then the second, um, in Europe, we can use uh, cleaner fish or wrath, which will eat the sea lice. Uh, so while we're still very dependent on chemicals for control, there's a lot of interest and how we can optimize the use of these cleaner fish to uh, reduce the number of chemical treatments and still have good control of sea lice. So we asked two questions. Can we use modeling techniques to quantify these optimal stocking levels? And how, how good does it work? How well does it work? Can we really reduce the need for chemical treatments? Again, we use, this time we use an individual-based model Here's the life cycle of the sea louse, somewhat simplified into various different stages. Um, again, we have these attached stages, mobile stages, and we divided it into male and females. Each stage has a certain probability of death. This is all coming from the literature. Uh, and we have actually, for all these transitions, um, we have temperature-dependent development. So we're incorporating some of that same data from the last model. We're also adding additional mortality. So we know that treatments affect all attached stages, um, at least the treatments we're considering, whereas the RAS really focus on eating these larger mobile uh, males and females. And we can have the RAS, whereas the treatments are a really uh, instantaneous event that just wipes out a population, these RAS feed at a constant rate every day. And that rate is dependent on uh, the number of RAS that are stocked. So I've showed you two different models. They kind of look like I just took this model, flipped it on its side, added some color. But they're actually quite different. So uh, this is a model for every individual. So every individual is being simulated. It starts here as an egg. It has a certain probability of developing, a certain probability of death. Um, and then it goes on through the other stages or dies. So if we ran this model with 100 individuals 100 times, the results would always be different. Um, in this case, we can have stochasticity, but we can also um, run this model without stochasticity. And each of these boxes represents a population of individuals at that stage. So they look similar. They're actually quite different. Whereas we can have equilibriums and look at things like r not here, um, it's quite a bit more challenging to look at it here. And what we're interested in in these individual-based models is what's called emergent behavior. So you kind of program the lowest level of information that you know on the, the individual, but you're interested in higher level properties, such as population dynamics, that emerge when you run the simulation. So here are some of our results. There's time on the x-axis, and then number of individuals uh, of these different stages here, males, females, pre-adults, and calamus. If we don't control, these are, these are the number of individuals on a single, um, single host salmon. So if we don't control the sea lice, we rapidly get to unrealistic numbers. Our salmon would die. If we just use RAS, we get better control, but it's still not uh, in the range that we're looking for. We can use chemical treatments. And every time you see this rapid, instantaneous population drop, that indicates there's a chemical treatment that's been used. Um, or we can use the combination of chemical treatments and RAS. And what you can see is there's a pretty big reduction in number of treatments needed when we have both. Uh, we can run these simulations a number of times, look at averages, uh, and in a year, the number of treatments required in a year to control a population decreases as we increase the RAS stocking ratio. So this might be a tool to help farmers 
decide how much RAS they need to stock. So the last question uh, we addressed with simulations was how population structure of sea lice influences evolutionary processes. And we're really interested in resistance to these chemicals that are used to control the lice. Uh, so the question we looked at was, how does a refugia from chemical treatments impact the evolution of resistance? So we've got our lice here, right? So on our salmon farm, the attached lice are on the salmon, and they're what get exposed to treatment, whereas the planktonic stages uh, are anywhere in the water column, and they're not really affected by treatments. Um, in some cases, in some situations, we also have wild salmon or wild trout. And so we've got this pool of planktonic lice that can be um, exposed to treatments on a farm or not exposed on what we're going to call the refugia, the wild salmon or the wild trout. And so if we get strong selection for resistance when we treat individuals here, um, we actually have no selection for resistance here. And if there's a cost of that resistance, you might actually get selection the opposite direction. Um, so we've, we've got both dilution of that resistant population and perhaps selection against resistance when we have refugia. So it's complicated, though, because these, these animals migrate. We don't know kind of what the um, transmission between these populations are. And so really to understand if this conceptual model is actually what, how the world works, um, at least get a bit closer, we used a, another individual-based model. So we took the same model that I just showed, and we added a number of new processes. So first we modeled both the host and the parasite, and the last one we just had the parasite. So we had included um, the salmon from the farmed and the wild populations. Uh, we've also added an, a, what's called an attribute to, to our agents, which are the lice. So we, we gave them a gene, um, which or two genes. Um, two alleles of a gene, sorry, um, that could be resistant or susceptible. And we had, we created a mechanism so these genes are inherited through Mendelian genetics. Um, so that meant we had to also have mating. So we made different behavioral uh, state charts for both males and females that was related to mating. And then we examined emergent properties again. So we're interested in the population growth of the sea lice, as well as the, the amount of resistance. So I'll just show you one result here, and these are from 100 simulations um, across, this is across 20 years, um, so definitely something we wouldn't be able to do outside of uh, uh, in silico process. So what we have are situations where we have no wild salmon, a few wild salmon, or as many wild salmon as we would have farm salmon. Um, and what you can see is when there's more wild salmon over time, you don't get much of an increase in the proportion of resistant alleles. Um, you can see these kind of bumps here because these are different farm cohorts that go in. So you get a lot of selection while the cohort is there, and then it's diluted again by that, by that uh, wild population. So oh, to kind of get at what Crawford was saying, why are, aren't we seeing uh, resistance evolving in places like British Columbia? One idea is that it, because there is a huge refugia of untreated wild salmon there, so the number of wild salmon relative to the number of farm salmon um, is orders of magnitude greater. In contrast, a place like Scotland or Norway, we have kind of the opposite trend where we have many more farm salmon than wild salmon, and we're seeing a lot of resistance. So I've showed you a few different simulations uh, that I think have some useful messages. They may not be absolutely correct, but at least they can move research forward and help to um, inform new studies and, and give us at least some hypotheses about how this system is working. So we now have predictions of how salinity and temperature uh, influence sea louse population growth uh, and some recommendations for uh, management of sea life in regards to uh, evolutionary processes and just keeping numbers low. So, turn it back to Crawford for well, the, the last. Of getting some questions, yeah. I'm going to just very quickly.
Please skip to these last couple of slides. Sorry, Maya. Yeah. Um, no, no you, it was um, me who held you up, so don't. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was more, more important to get uh, some input from you. Um, one thing that Maya didn't mention is that we've been doing a number of these uh, modeling approaches that are over and above just the, the couple that we've uh, mentioned there. So we are looking quite a lot more at hydrodynamic and physical oceanographic models. But one of the interesting um, projects that Maya and I were involved with with Norwegian colleagues recently was trying to look at how we actually integrate some of these models across different scales and look at uh, how, for example, a farm-based population model might be integrated into a much wider scale um, hydrodynamic oceanographic model. And again, there's a lot of challenges there that we can't get into today. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of a, ta uh, a sense or a taste for how we can use data and different kinds of uh, statistical and mathematical models in the case of sea lice. And of course, I just need to leave you with a couple of quotes, one of which is a very famous George Box quote that I always like to give my students, uh, which uh, is very important to understand, you know, no models are correct. All models are wrong, but some are useful. And then uh, the very famous physicist Richard Feynman also talking about um, the issue of the importance of data and it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is or how smart you are, but it doesn't with experimental data. It's wrong. So there we go. And in the spirit of uh, St. Andrew's hospitality, we were looking for some sort of closing messages to take away last night, and we thought we needed something to help us uh, think about what that take-home message was. And we just happened to notice here that on this little uh, bottle of uh, <laughs> um, evening brew, uh, we found that, uh, like the Belhaven space eye oak-aged blonde ale, apparently, uh, models should be both complex, layered, and polished. I'm not sure all our models are quite as polished as we like. Uh, certainly some of them are complex, and the issue of layering is, is very important in integration. But I hope that's given you a little bit of an insight into some of the work that we do. And thank you so much for coming along and uh, your attention. Thanks. <laughs> I think formally we don't have that much time for questions, but Maya and I are around all afternoon, so we're also quite happy to have a coffee or whatever chats with folks if you've got particular interest that you'd like to chat with us about. But I think we do have time for just a few quick questions. Yes, sir. It's really an nice one. I mean, the sort of, where would some honors be on the planet if they hadn't been introduced to them? And in places like New Zealand, where there's lots of some what's the situation there in terms of the, 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 the sort of, in the north part of the South Island, there's a fair amount of sand production. It's not huge. And also in Tasmania, in uh, the southern reaches of Australia, there's some sand farming. Now, neither of these two regions have there actually been any problem, significant problem or any problems with sea lights. Which is kind of interesting because in Chile, which is also an introduced species of Atlantic, you know, salmon there. Yeah, yeah. Well, well in the Chilean case, this uh, this parasite of rockfish, uh, seem, which is a, a, a generalist parasite, moved across into the salmon farms and seemed to be quite successful in settling. I don't know why we haven't found an equivalent um, naturally occurring parasite in some of the the native species in Tasmania and, and New Zealand. Chris might have a view. On that, no, not necessarily. Yeah. So I, don't, I, I think the answer is we don't really know, but it is an interesting question. It's also one of these things why I don't think we can have one model fitting all, because clearly that model would break down as soon as you get to New Zealand, because there's something different about what's happening there. I think from, from the salinity cold and then yep. something like that, that yep. Yep. you know, go north and up river, there's the places where there is an issue, and you have a very well, more profitable salmon farming. Indeed, so, yeah. Salmon farms. I mean, is there a yeah, yeah. downside for the cold for the salmon? They grow so much slower, it doesn't make it feasible? Or? Well, there's not many, so many people live there, so I suppose there's also an economic argument. But if you look at, sort of, for example, in, in Norway, they are farming them as far north as uh, Finnmark. It is, you're right, you're right. But even up in Finnmark, it's pretty cold, and, and they don't have the same issues. I mean, we just finished a study on the west coast of Vancouver Island, where it's a lot colder, and particularly if you get into these kind of estuarine things with a lot of snow melt. And we've sort of looked at seven or eight farms in two different river systems there, and they essentially get away with treating once every season, every cycle. And that's as much chemical treatment as you need to use. Totally different scenario from what you get in the North Atlantic or indeed on the, on the east coast of Vancouver. So. Mm -hmm. I would also add that there are some species that are better in yeah. Sorry, question. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and or they get eaten by the big salmon. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's actually one of the strengths of of the individualist model, actually, Chris, because doing something like that with a system dynamic model or something that's based around a system of equations is not so easy. But actually, just in the same way that we sort of added uh, genetic allele behavior and, and resistance characteristics to these lights, so we could look at uh, sort of a, a very specific life history of uh, the cleaner fish and uh, actually vary that behavior quite dramatically depending where we're in, their, in, the life, in the life cycle of the salmon that they were actually predating on. So I think actually the individual based model would be quite uh, amenable to that kind of, I mean what do you think yeah. you were really the author of that? Um, well I think we, were, we wanted to add some more um, dynamics like with the different feeding behavior and the rats that in the we about what rats do in the future, but in the future, we were limited by data. So I would say that model that we made was very hypothetical. And in some ways, it was a call, you know, we can do this if you give us the data. Um, so it's sort of hoping that you get a bit more feedback. Even though computationally we're getting much better technology, if you don't want to run this on a supercomputer, so you just want to use, say, a quad or, or an eight processor machine, it's still quite expensive. So in the case of having both um, agent, lice agents and salmon um, agents, we were really restricted to about a thousand salmon because we got to 50 or 100 lice in, in the extreme conditions per salmon. So once you're actually starting to model, you know, tens of thousands of individuals over a 20 year time period, you're starting to use either a reasonable amounts of resource and or it's going to take you a week to run your simulation. So there's some of those practical things you have to factor in. Yeah. Sorry, Gordon. Yeah. And then, yeah. <coughs> No, the resistance of the light. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Two or more. Yeah. Well, as you, two, two things that may be worth saying. One is that this is a paper that's still very much, so these results, we should really show you these in a sense because they're still in review. We haven't actually published uh, the results of this. And in fact, this is a slight, we've purposely chosen a slightly older output, so we've modified these in, in the actual paper that's been submitted. Um, I think the honest answer is we don't honestly know, but we're interested to observe that on the assumptions that we've built into the model, it does appear that this kind of scenario, which does typify the Scottish, New Brunswick, Norwegian, south of Finnmark type scenario, this is actually consistent with the way in which it appears resistance has developed in those populations. And this is much more consistent with what's happened in British Columbia. In other words, there's still no apparent problem in British Columbia in terms of uh, resistance. In fact, one of the interesting things, that we're, one of the follow-on pieces of work here we're doing is we try to keep this model very generic so it's not fitted to specific um, parameters for any one system. So even, for example, the, the return of wild salmon will be different in different regions. The presence of sea trout, which are like migrating on and offshore all the time. So none of that has actually been simulated. It's more of a conceptual thinking piece initially, but we do hope to parameterize that and actually turn it into something more realistic. And there's actually been some very, well, don't tell anyone I said this, but there has been a little bit of evidence of some problems of resistance in very limited patches in British Columbia. We're working with people who are looking at some of the genetic tools to actually look at markers for those um, resistance traits in life. 
and we're going to try and see whether the model can explain potentially why that's happening in these very specific localities and not generally across British Columbia. So it's still a very much a work in progress. I think that'd be an honest uh, response, and, and we're hopeful that it's it's a flexible model. But you might be right. Maybe we're cut two stars. Maybe the world's too complex to be modeled in a simple way. Sorry. That's cool. okay. hmm. Yeah, we had a And I think again that is a strength of this particular paradigm that we can probably explore some of those things and modify the model without too much difficulty to, to explore some of those questions down the line. So this is, as Maya said, this is really one part, it's probably only a, a quarter of a much bigger project which is really focused around um, looking at genetic technologies for um, better understanding of, of what's happening with resistance. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I've, I've, there are plenty of examples of um, um, disease resistance in animals and lots more in plants. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. very plausible. Yeah. But I was intrigued about the idea that there was a cost associated with it, so it might be selected against. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence for that, or is that just um, an assumption? Uh, at this point, it was an assumption. Um, we chose to play around with that. If you don't make that assumption, um, it actually less plausible. Yeah, um, it doesn't change the model such as we would have thought. Actually, mm -hmm. we put in a um, the one percent reduction in fatality with the real, with the two percent real, and um, it slowed down the evolution process. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, sorry to go on so long. If you can sell that grant to the salmon producers, they should do salmon ransom to help out the fishermen rather than the things that are here, right? I mean, this could be a good deal for everybody. If they could convince them they're going to get some economic benefit by releasing lots of salmon. Or, or as Hor Tor Horsberg uh, proposed in Norway, that you could uh, introduce uh, large populations of uh, susceptible sea lice. Uh, just add some sea lice to your soup. Uh, <laughs> and not worry too much about it. Yeah. Good. Yes. Chris. Did you explain the fish that fascinating work you're doing in Africa? Oh, no. Well, I've probably not have time to, to go into that, but I think just in terms of this whole issue of models and, uh, and data, uh, I just came back from uh, a new project that we've got going in uh, Eastern Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, and Tanzania. Um, and one of the one of my other sort of interests has been on differential diagnosis uh, and using sort of Bayesian uh, models of inference to see whether we can actually make as good or hopefully eventually better diagnoses than uh, trained veterinarians. Sorry, don't tell the vets I said that. But, uh, and it's not really designed to replace a veterinarian. It's designed for contexts where there's poor availability of those kinds of trained personnel. And you obviously, you've often got a very poorly trained animal health system to don't really have the diagnostic capacity to do differential diagnosis. In, in this case, we started with bovine um, diseases. Uh, because capital one of the main uh, sources of financial support there. But I'm working with a small software company, actually a Scottish company, a startup company, who are developing mobile apps to uh, be distributed on phones uh, to these uh, animal health technicians. And in fact, there's maybe 700 
uh, new users going out in Kenya over the next six months in seven different districts. And essentially it's a new approach, not just to disease diagnosis, but also to disease surveillance. Historically what happens is you have this very top-down approach, the government says we'll do this active surveillance, we'll pay this half a million dollars we get from FAO to, to go and do uh, disease surveillance, and there's all kinds of problems with that, it's very patchy, it takes a long time for the funds to come in uh, once the money dries up, so does the surveillance data. We're trying this sort of the bottom-up approach where we get farmers, animal health assistants, and, and um, veterinarians to use the tool as part of their ongoing day-to-day -day job for the task of diagnosing or prescribing drugs or looking at drug efficacy, but as a byproduct of that, we'll get information on syndromes and signs associated with disease. So actually be able to build up disease profiles um, across these countries. And one of the other interesting things is what, if you know anything about sort of Bayesian belief networks and, and the combinatorics of um, what happens is as soon as you have conditional or non-conditionally independent variables, uh, for every other variable you add in, you just get this comfortable explosion in terms of the number of parameters you need to specify. So we can use a sort of a data-driven process to say, okay, we know that the way in which uh, trypanosomiasis will be expressed in exotic cattle in a hybrid region of Ethiopia is different from the way that that disease will be expressed in a cross-fed animal in the lowland condition. But rather than worrying too much about fitting all those parameters up front, because we probably can't do that, there's not enough expert knowledge out there, there's not information in literature, let's make some simplifying assumptions as a first cut, and then let's use the data as we go forward on a learning basis to actually modify those parameters so you eventually get divergent parameter estimates for the different uh, spatial or breed or whatever the, the environmental characteristics that change the presentation of disease in different animals under different circumstances. So it's kind of a using bringing data technology in terms of the distribution of that, uh, that solution on mobile platforms. Uh, collecting all that, even just collecting all that information on the cloud which we're doing and, and having instantaneous feedback on what the disease profile looks like in these places is a big move forward for many of the kind of uh, surveillance tasks in, in some of these uh, countries which are challenged in terms of getting that disease awareness. So that's just one of the other ways that we're applying with data and data-driven models in a very different, more efficient context, uh, which I'm just interested in the sabbatical in particular. It's a good excuse to go into something in more interesting places than, no, I'm sure St. Andrews and, well, Wester Ross is beautiful in the winter and, and lots of uh, places where their fish farms are very nice to visit, but it's, it's nice to get to somewhere a little bit different as well. So hopefully it gives you a little bit of insight, Chris. Thank you, Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Thank you very much for coming along the way. Not at all. Thanks for having us. Oh, sorry, we've got a question from somebody here on the, if they're still online. Okay, yeah, look, sorry, the quick answer is that we haven't. <laughs> um, they can hear us. It is something that's been, that has, there's actually not that much in the literature. It's back to Maya's issue about the, some of the cleaner fish questions that we don't actually have the data to support that. So, I mean, Chris, you can speak about that as well, but I mean, there has been a little bit of, uh, there was issues about, you know, whether uh, challenge by sea lice leads to higher susceptibility to infectious salmonemia, for example, or other diseases. Um, the jury, I think, is out still a little bit on exactly how important those are as part of the process. But it's kind of an interesting idea in terms of that notion of integrating models. If you have a model of an infectious disease such as infectious salmonemia, or one of the other interesting things that we are actually looking at at the minute is um, uh, amoebic gill disease um, has really made a, a large uh, resurgence in the last two or three years in Norway and Scotland. And one of the main treatment options there is to use hydrogen peroxide which actually also happens to be one of the sea lice treatments. So it's been quite interesting to unpick uh, the treatment profile in salmon farms over the last two years because the use of hydroperoxide has just skyrocketed since 2012. And if you didn't understand that um, maybe gill disease was at the root of that, you might think it was a, a salmon, a sea lice issue. But of course it does then confound your interpretation of sea lice control data because we've got this uh, large concurrent disease. So it's quite an interesting point that looking at some of these disease systems in isolation is not necessarily going to be uh, 
the best way forward, and sometimes we might, particularly if we have these two diseases that are quite significantly occurring together, it might be important to look at secondary infections. So hopefully that answers the question on the webinar. Thanks again. Good. Thank you. <clears throat>